Uh, tonight, it is my pleasure once again to introduce you to our friend, Dr. Alan Berger. We're continuing our series of workshops on emotional sobriety. Dr. Berger speaks to our group on the first Monday of each month throughout 2022. Tonight, it's the eighth part of his discussion, and it's how about how we can apply his 12 essential insights for emotional sobriety to our recovery to achieve growth in our programs. And that book, 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety, is Alan's latest book. He's written several books on recovery, and they're all based on the 12 steps, and they're wonderful. So um, with that, I'm going to tell you again that Alan brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to us every single month in his presentations. And... Um, it's always followed by a Q&A session. So here we go. Alan will be talking about the insight number eight from his book. And that eighth insight is discovering novel solutions. And with that, Alan, take it away. It's so good to see you again. Thank you, Susie. And so good to be here with you. And on this chilly Monday afternoon in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It's raining outside, it's about 50 degrees, and definitely we're moving into fall. Uh, I can feel it in my bones, so to speak. <laughs> um, well, look, I'm so glad to be able to share with you um, my you know, work from my latest book, 12 Essential Insights in Emotional Sobriety. Today, we're gonna be talking about discovering novel solutions to situations that are challenging you. So without further ado, let me jump in and share my slides with you. I hope you can all see that. Is that correct, Susie? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So these are this this these discussions are based on, like Susie said, my new book, 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety. It is available on Amazon. Now I like to start out by just going back over some basic ideas about emotional sobriety. Um, <clears throat> some of you have heard versions or variations of these, but it's always important to remind ourselves what this is. And so let's start with, with defining this thing and trying to understand what we're trying to achieve here. So I see emotional sobriety as a practice in our life. And it's a practice that transcends, which means that we move beyond a consciousness that demands environmental support for our emotional well being and security. And it moves us towards in a direction of a consciousness that's based on self-support. Now that's gonna become a lot more obvious later on when I'm talking about this, but that self-support creates a consciousness of emotional freedom because your well-being is dependent on what you do, not what's happening to you, not what other people are doing. And you see, that's the big shift as you're going to see is that in emotional sobriety, we transform a consciousness that says, I'm okay if. It's a very conditional state of being. I'm okay if things turn out the way that I want them to. I'm okay if things turn out the way they're, quote, supposed to turn out. I'm okay if you behave the way you should behave if you say that you care about me. Now, we call that that I'm okay if all of the propositions that fall underneath that idea, unenforceable rules. And they are rules that we impose on life, on ourselves, on others, that are based on the idea that if, you, if things go this way, I'll be okay. Now, what we want to replace that consciousness with is a consciousness that unhooks us from the if part. And so we want a consciousness that says, I'm okay even if I don't get what I want. I'm okay even if things don't turn out the way they're supposed to. I'm okay if you don't act the way I think you should act. 
And so my being okay depends on my relationship with what I'm experiencing, not what I'm experiencing. This creates a true spirit of independence. Now, there's a paradoxical theory of change that's operating in recovery all over the place. It starts with step one, where we admit it, we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. See, in order to transcend our environmental dependence, and that's the, the dependence that if things work this way, that's what I mean by environmental dependence, I'll be okay. You know, we must become aware of how our behavior is determined by the gravitational forces created by this, what Bill called almost absolute dependence, and, and that we must surrender these crippling demands that things have to be this way for us to be okay. They really don't. And I call this the biggest lie because it really, really complicates. Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. So this was the insight that Bill had and that he shared in 1956 in a letter to someone out in California in 1958 this was published in the AA grapevine under the title of emotional sobriety the next frontier so he realized right that his basic flaw meaning the issue that was underlying everything that was causing him problems was this what he called almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances, supply me with proceed security and the like. See, that's what I call environmental support. That I need people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security and the like means I'm depending on my environment to do for me what I'm unable to do for myself. When things didn't go the way Bill wanted them to or when people didn't behave, According to his, he called it perfectionist dreams and specifications. You see, we come up with an idea and, and it, it becomes an absolute idea. That's why he calls it perfectionistic, is that if things go this way, if things are, and it's a very black and white thing, that's the perfectionism. If things happen this way, then I'm okay. If not, then I don't know what to do. What Bill did is when things didn't go his way, he fought for them. That's one of three responses to the situation. You know, we move towards people. That's moving to please them, move against them. That's fighting for, for what you want. That's what Bill did. That was his style. Or you just move away from people and you throw in the towel and you give up. When Bill fought for them and people didn't go along with the, the, his ideas about what they should do, he felt defeated. And then his depression followed. That's what he learned. That's what he, the insight that he garnered with all the work he had done at trying to figure out what was causing his depression. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. Because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. You see, when we go back and we really do an inventory of our emotional dependence, it really does reveal the extent that these frightful dependencies have been controlling our life. It's pretty shocking when people actually do that. And I really encourage people to do that in terms of if you're going to work on your emotional dependence and your emotional sobriety, you've got to understand your emotional dependency in order to be able to develop this emotional sobriety. What he realized is that he had to cut, he called them fatal because they actually are. I mean, so many homicides are committed, you know, by someone who feels rejected in a relationship because they're operating under the thing that they need this person to love them to be okay 
It's a terrible curse that we have. And we've got to let go. If we've got any chance of growing up, we've got to start surrendering these crippling expectations, these crippling demands. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed upon any act or circumstance whatsoever. Then could I be free to love as Francis did. Emotional and instinctual satisfactions I saw were really the extra dividends of having love, offering love, and expressing love appropriate to each relation of life. So this is what Bill concluded, is that he really had to make this a focus of his recovery to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies. Now, people understand that when they say about people. They understand about circumstances, upon any act or circumstance whatsoever. But when he says upon AA, people often pause and say, really? I mean, you know, isn't recovery about replacing one unhealthy dependence with a healthy one upon the program? Well, the answer to that is no. The truth of this is that the program is designed to help grow you in the direction of this true independence of spirit, in the direction of a consciousness of emotional freedom. So the program is, help, is to help you learn how to stand on your two feet and truly take care of yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that Bill was advocating a fierce independence because that gets us in trouble. He means if you need help, it's your responsibility to get it and not wait for somebody else to figure it out. So we're not talking about a fierce individualism. We're talking about a person who takes responsibility for themselves. Herb Kagan and I like to call it radical responsibility, right? That you are responsible for your existence. You are responsible for the life you're creating. You are responsible for how you cope with whatever situations you're confronting in your life. He says, once we start to take this kind of an attitude in our life, then we start to really have what we could call unconditional love. This being free to love. We can have love, offer love and express love appropriate to each relation of life, which also means that we don't need to like everyone that's in our life or have a close relationship with them, is that we have people that we're going to be naturally more, you know, closer to than others. And that's okay. You know, you may prefer chicken over steak. That doesn't make you wrong. You just have preferences in your life. Plainly, I could not avail myself to God's love until I was able to offer it back to him by loving others as he would have me. And I couldn't possibly do that so long as I was victimized by false dependencies. For my dependencies meant demand, a demand for the possession and control of the people and the conditions surrounding me. While those words absolute dependence may look like a gimmick, they were the ones that helped to trigger my release into my present degree of stability and quietness of mind, qualities which I am now trying to consolidate by offering love to others, regardless of the return to me. See, this is what was being alluded to in the second half of the first step, that our lives had become unmanageable. Because when we try to manage our life by demanding the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding us, we create a mess. We create, our life becomes a total mess. And Bill had to really take a look and own that. And it's a very difficult thing for a lot of people to do. I've seen people do much better with the first half of the first step, accepting their powerlessness than accepting their unmanageability. Of course, I haven't offered you a really new idea, only a gimmick that has started to unhook several of my own hexes at depth. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsively in either elation, grandiosity, or depression. 
I've been given a quiet place in bright sunshine. Well, thank you, Bill, for such a wonderful contribution to our recovery. I like to think of this as Bill's fourth legacy. You know, the first three legacies Dr. Bob and Bill left us were the steps, you know, the general service office and the traditions. But this is his fourth legacy, emotional sobriety. Now, emotional sobriety can also be thought of as is related to stage two recovery. This is Ernie Larson. And if you're into reading a lot about recovery, you've already encountered the work of Ernie. He's, he's passed away a number of years ago, um, but he's left us with a lot of wonderful, wonderful literature for us to continue to learn from him and grow from his insights. But this is what he said about stage two recovery. Stage one recovery was breaking the bonds of our addiction. In stage two recovery, he says, this is about dealing with the mountain of living is what stage two recovery is all about. How do we cope with life? See, that's what stage two recovery gets at. How are you dealing with your disappointment? How do you deal with when things don't go your way? How do you understand your anxiety or your depression? How do you deal with your frustration? What do you do when a friend or a partner or a spouse doesn't do what you want them to do? How do you manage that difficulty? What do you do when you have a conflict with someone? See, all those things are about the mountain of living, right? That we're all confronted with in life. He says, stage two recovery is about getting on with life, meaning becoming aware of and facing those patterns and habits and attitudes that control your life. You see, many of the things that are controlling you and your behavior are probably outside of your consciousness. You are unable to see them until you choose to really focus on the patterns and habits. And the way to do that is to really back into them. It's kind of to make a deduction, kind of be a detective, right? And say, my God, I'm so upset about this. What's going on with me that I'm so upset about this? What does this mean to me? What unenforceable rule is being violated inside me right now that I'm reacting to? See, awareness of these things is the first step. Awareness and accepting them is the first step in our movement, in our growth, in our, in our attempt to achieve emotional sobriety. It says we face these things that because perhaps for the first time in our lives, we're clear-headed, sober enough, or emotionally sound enough to face them. It is very true that the longer you're in the program, more will be revealed. You are going to be able to get more and more honest with yourself. In fact, I truly believe that as you're in the program for a while, the best in you can start to see the worst in you. And it's hard to see that early on. The best in you sees the worst in you. So we are now on essential insight number eight. And just like with the steps, you know, all of the previous insights have built us up to this point in time. So I would encourage you, join the WhatsApp group, go back. If you haven't been with us through these seven previous seven insights, go back and listen to them because they will put this in a context, I think, that becomes so important. So this one is about discovering novel solutions. And I have a picture of a brain down here, don't I? You're looking from the top down, right? This is a superior view of the brain. And you're looking on the right side is the right hemisphere and the left side is the left hemisphere of the brain. Well, that's going to become important because as we dig into this stuff, we need to see how we can use our consciousness to start to solve problems that baffle us and to deal with them from a different perspective. But let's first of all talk about what is normal behavior? What does healthy behavior look like? This is Dr. Joseph Zinker. He was uh, one of the directors of the Cleveland Institute of Gestalt Therapy. He's passed away. He's also left us a lot of wonderful books. 
But what he said in his book about creativity and therapy, he says the ordinary state of affairs for a normal person is to move fluidly from a state of need arousal to need satisfaction. Now, we call that the psychological imperative. You are always going to move in the direction of satisfying a need. If you are hungry, you're going to think about eating something until you, I had a bowl of cereal a minute ago because I wanted to have my cereal before I joined you because I was hungry. Because if not, I'd be sitting here thinking, what am I going to eat after I'm done with you guys? And now I don't have to think about that. Now I can focus on you. You see, when I don't take care of a need, it's always going to be pressing to be taken care of. So when we're healthy, we move through this cycle of experience that you're going to see in a minute. We move from need arousal to need satisfaction. From tension, I'm upset about something, to solving the problem, now I'm relaxed about it. From figural attention to a homogenized disinterest. So when I am, my need is aroused, if I'm driving down the freeway, I am going to notice every billboard that has to do with food. And after I pull into my McDonald's and get my filet of fish sandwich, I get back on the freeway and guess what happens? I don't even see those billboards with food anymore. If I'm tired and I'm driving on the freeway and I'm thinking about finding a place to stay, what jumps out? All of the billboards now said, pull over here, there's a Holiday Inn, or there's this hotel or that hotel. So that figural attention, that's how we take care of our need. We focus our awareness on our environment to see what is possible in my environment to get my need met. And, you know, there's a lot of McDonald's. I can get a lot of filet of fish sandwiches if I'm driving down the freeway. He goes, moreover, a well-functioning person lives comfortably. And this is what Carl Rogers said. He goes, a well-functioning person lives comfortably in the changing flow of his experience. You see, it's a myth that now is a static thing. Staying in the here and now doesn't mean you just stay somewhere. The now is always moving to next. Now is always flowing to the next experience. And if we're a well-functioning individual, that now will be informed by us finding a way to take care of our needs. So the person, we are an ongoing process. We do not experience ourselves as a static object, but as an object that is in constantly in relationship with ourself and with our environment and with the people in our environment. That's who we are. Now, it is under the circumstances of disturbance, and that's what we want to pay attention to, what goes wrong, right? It is under the circumstances of disturbance of conditioned inhibition. Now, take a minute to unpack that. Conditioned inhibition comes from the shoulds that are in your life. There are certain things that you think you should do and that are okay to do, and there are certain things that are taboo that you shouldn't do. Most people feel that they should be reasonable. They should be a nice person. So it would be taboo to be unreasonable, it would be taboo to not be a nice person, to be mean and grumpy or whatever. Um, so this condition inhibition means that certain things are okay for us to do and certain things are not okay for us to do. When our life is fragmented in that way, we say that we are fixed. When you are fixed, you, you narrow the range of possibilities in terms of how to cope with a situation. I can give you an example. I was talking uh, to a mother and her son today, and um, 
her son gets on the phone with her. It's the first session that I've had with them together. And he starts out by saying, you know, I, I'm, I, I feel so bad. I'm just a fucking loser. My whole life I've been a loser. I'm still a loser. I think I'm just going to always be a loser. And then we start, to, and then I says, okay, well, I hear that. He says, can you tell me some of the stuff that goes on with your mom? He says, well, we fight all the time. What are some of the things you fight about? Well, she comes over to the house and she wants to start cleaning up my house. <laughs> She's not happy with my house being messy the way it is. I said, well, give me an example of it. Well, for example, I like my couch at this weird angle. And when mom comes in, she says, the couch isn't supposed to be that way. It's got to be this way. He goes, but when I sit in the couch that way, the light from the kitchen's in my eyes and I can't see the TV as well. I like it on the angle. But for his mom, that's wrong. Now, is she trying to be helpful? Of course she is. She's a very caring mother. She's not malicious in any way. Is she damaging her kid's self-esteem? No question about it. Somebody asked me to talk about the, the mother and son a little bit more. I was just saying that when she comes in and with her best intentions, she keeps cleaning his house without, you know, without him asking her for help. Then she's sending the message to him, you're not doing it right. Now, you know, with my session, I was able to help him now stand up for himself and say, you know, mom, you know, I, I want the couch where it is. So, you know, don't, you're not going to change my couch anymore. I have a right to do this. And I got all over him about this idea that he's a loser. You know, he's, he's accepted this stuff. And if he keeps thinking about himself in this way, that's never going to change. And I says that, you know, what I'd like to see you do is to take on that part of you. And we're going to talk about finding better solutions to our problems. So instead of just accepting things the way they are, he could start objecting. And his mom, she started to see these things and she realized the mistake that she's been making with him. Now, it's going to probably take some time for her to clean it up because it's so habitual at this point. And once again, she's not a bad person. She thinks that that's helpful, but things that are fixed cannot be helpful all the time. Maybe there are certain times when helping out like that is welcomed and needed. But when that becomes the typical way of responding, it becomes problematic. So that's, you know, we're talking about this, this conditioned inhibition, you know, she goes, of a pathology that interrupts one's flow, right? So moving from now to next involves me having a certain relationship with myself. It involves me having a certain relationship with my environment. It allows me being able to support myself to stand up and to get what I want and what I need or to at least struggle for it. She goes, that interrupts one's flow, segments one's behavior. That Before I was talking about the segmented behavior um, and freezes one fluidity. You know, we cannot be flexible in situations like that. Flexibility becomes such an important part of learning how to find novel solutions to our problems. Um, so this is the... Uh, Oh, I got this twice. This case, and uh, whatever it is, the individual, in this case, the individual's psychological life's in a state of incongruence where there is considerable discrepancy between behavior and awareness. So the mom is saying, I'm, I'm wanting to be helpful. I'm wanting to be helpful. Her behavior is not. And you see, one of the things we see in a person that is a high functioning person is there is a congruence between what they want to do and what they're doing. It's not incongruent. Behavior is not incongruent with intention. So here's the inherent wisdom of the cycle of experience. We are wired. This is the psychological imperative, the biological imperative. We are wired to move from desire to fulfillment and then to calm. That's how we're wired. 
Sometimes it's not going to be that clear. I was able to go downstairs and get a bowl of cereal. Nobody hid, was hiding the cereal on me. I found the milk in the refrigerator. It all kind of flowed for me right now, right? But if I have a desire and, and my fulfillment is not readily available, then there may be some conflict and struggle that has to take place. Then if I meet that frustration in the right way, I will feel fulfilled and calm. But when the struggle is insufficient to create that fulfillment, then another two elements have to be added to the process in our life. We go from desire to conflict and struggle with what we want. And when it's not going to happen, we experience and we embrace our disappointment and now allow ourselves to grieve. And when we grieve, sufficiently, we will feel the calm. So, in life, those three paths are the three paths we're always going to be taking. You know, sometimes it'll be very simple. Desire, fulfillment, calm. Sometimes it's going to struggle. You know, if I want something from you and, and I feel that, that somehow I need to have this and you're not giving it to me. I had it with a friend of mine the other day. Um, we're having a disagreement about an issue about um, a book that we're working on together. And um, I sat down and I wrote him all my thoughts about it. And I get this, this email from him, back from him saying, you know, I told you I don't want to talk about this stuff on email, da 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 da, -da. And so now we got the conflict going on. And he says, it's bullshit. You know, I told you that it's bullshit that you're doing it. I wrote back and I said, no, what's bullshit is what you're doing. I, I'm going to do this my way. I need to write about it. If you're not interested in responding, don't respond. Respond when we talk on the phone. That's how you want it. But you don't get to dictate how I'm doing it. So we talked on the phone last night. And he says, I see your point. I was done with it. I was finished with it. I struggled with it. I struggled for what I want. I'm not going to lose my individuality. I'm not going to give myself up to meet your needs. You know, go ahead, do it the way you want to do it. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And I held on to myself that way. And then we figured it out. If that didn't happen, then I'd have to experience disappointment and, and grief in our relationship. But we were able to find another path, thankfully so. We have that kind of relationship, and I trust we can do that with each other. So the problem is never the problem. It's how we typically define a problem that creates the problem and then makes it impossible to cope well with. You see, the more rules you have, the more, the more you're unable to, to challenge your idea of things, meaning when there's not enough curiosity about how you're approaching things and what you're doing to create your struggle with the issue that you're confronting, then you're not going to be able to grow. You know, I really think that that our way of that we define most of our problems in our life make it impossible to cope well with it. If my problem is that you're not doing something the way I want you to do it, guess what? I'm defining my problem in an impossible way because it involves changing you. And that's not going to work. You may gave in sometimes, but eventually you're not going to like that idea that you got to do everything I want you to do for this relationship to be okay. Then there's no room for you in it. So we need to strive to define problems in a way that leads to a solution. Coping well allows us to let things go. We can let go because we are finished with it. We are done. There's no reason to hold on. When I had that situation with my friend the other day, after I sent the email, actually it didn't matter what his response was going to be. I was finished. I stood up for myself. I was done with that. It was great that he responded in the way he did, but it didn't matter. So emotional sobriety is about learning to cope with life as it is, not as we'd like it to be or as it's supposed to be or should be, but as it is. And in order to mature and learn how to better cope, we need to be aligned with what is happening, aligned with reality, not fighting it or objecting to it or denying it. <clears throat> That's a surefire recipe for ruining your life if you want to do that. 
So if we accept the situation we are in and let the situation inform our actions, then we lean to learn, then we learn how to cope with it. Then we learn, then we mature, then we start to grow up. So without radical acceptance of what is, there can be no maturity. We will not be able to transcend our dependency on environmental support. Now, what are some of the blocks to creativity? So when we're meeting a situation and we're trying to figure out a creative solution to it, what are some of the things that are going to block us? Well, perfectionism. Thinking things have to be a certain way for this situation to work out and to be able to be resolved. That's going to stop you from finding or inventing a novel solution. Fear of failing, that it's not going to work out. Oh, my God, I can't fail. So then we're not going to try. You know, procrastination, I think, is a lot of times a fear of failure based on perfectionism. A reluctance to play or be absurd is being willing to be silly or consider outrageous responses to situations may be the thing that's just needed to turn things around. A resource myopia, being too independent. Resource myopia means that you cannot see the possibilities around because you're thinking it has to be this way. You lose sight of the other possibilities around you. Being too independent or being too dependent will create that resource myopia. Over certainty. I know how this has to be done. Oh, yeah, really? You do, huh? Well, how come it's not working? Well, I'm not trying hard enough. Okay, try harder. Well, it's still not working. What's the problem? Well, you're not, you know, whatever it is. We start blaming people at that point in time. So here's some other blocks to creativity. Reluctance to let go, our need for control, that it has to be the way that we want it to be if it's going to be, if we're going to be okay with it. An impoverished emotional life, if you don't have a healthier relationship with yourself, meaning that you're nurturing yourself, it's going to be very difficult to deal with situations. You're not going to have a lot to give. Being unintegrated in many areas of your life, meaning that, that you haven't really done the work and gone down and deal with this fragmentation of self that occurs for every person in life. Sensory dullness meaning that you have holes in either seeing, hearing, feeling, or speaking. You see, in every situation, when we grow up, that we're met in certain ways with, let's say, if, if it was a traumatic situation, well, we will adapt to that trauma in the best way possible. Well, oftentimes that adaptation will result in some kind of a compromise with either uh, we don't want to see things clearly because it's too painful. We don't want to hear what's going on. We don't want to feel what's going on. We lose our voice and we can't speak up. All of these things are going to interfere with our ability to solve a problem and being emotionally dependent as we've talked about. Customer stimulus bound is that you see a situation and like a hammer and you can only use the hammer to pound in a nail. Well, that means you're stimulus bound, but that hammer may work in another way, in a situation that you could use it to help you to help you deal with a problem with not using the hammer in the way that it was intended to use at all. Impoverished fantasy life, unwilling to be able to fantasize about what might be another possibility or fear of the unknown or fear of just not knowing or being ignorant, not wanting to look stupid. Oh, my God, I can't tell you how much this interferes with people and their functioning. And a reluctance to insert your influence and feel your power in a situation. Like when I stood up for myself with my friend the other day, I was exerting my influence. I was standing up for myself. Now, this is Rollo Main. He says this, one can define mental health from one side as the capacity to be aware of the gap between the stimulus and response together with the capacity to use the gap constructively so that we want to get into that space between the stimulus and response. But we want to use that pause, that space constructively. Now, to do that, we might have to be able to think out of the box. So let me introduce you quickly to some neuropsychology. 
I realize that um, I've got about 20 more minutes. I'm going to go a little longer, Susie, and we'll leave 20 minutes for discussion today since we got interrupted. So this is looking down at a person. That's the person knows at the top of the photo. This is the back of their head. That's looking at their hemispheres, right? The right and left hemisphere. All of that folded tissue is the cerebral cortex. That's where all your abstract thinking takes place. That's where our ability to have an awareness of ourself occurs, right? That what makes us, you know, different from any other species on a planet. No other species has this kind of a cerebral cortex. And it's folded over because when you fold it over like that, you've got much more area. So you can put a lot of cortex inside of a skull. Now that skull, and so the brain kind of floats in there on cerebral spinal fluid. And a lot of people don't understand this, but blood never touches your brain. There's a blood brain barrier. And so the blood carries up nutrients to your brain, like glucose and oxygen and other things that your brain needs to function, but it never touches it. There's always a barrier between the blood. If the blood touches your brain tissue, it touches neurons, it kills them. That's what happens when a person has a stroke, right? When they have a hemorrhage in their brain, the blood spills out in a portion of the brain and it kills all of the neurons in that particular area of the brain so you don't want to have blood on your brain nope not good not a good thing at all now the that tissue and the brain and not just the cerebral cortex but all of the brain consists of 86 billions of these things you know this is what's called a neuron right and you see that these neurons send signals it's like there's an electrical impulse that takes place given the, the chemical reaction that takes place at that place called the synapse, the synapse. Now, each of these, these branches, you see where they have that myelin sheet? That's like an insulation so that when our brain is working well, these things pass in a very, very organized very specific sequential way. And they create thought and behavior and all kinds of great stuff that happens. Some diseases take away that myelin sheath. Like MS, when a person has multiple sclerosis, they lose the ability to control their body because now the signaling doesn't go through. They found that in the synapses that certain neurochemicals like serotonin, norepinephrine start to are depleted when we get depressed or where there's an increased thing feeling good it takes place at the synapses with dopamine and other things so these become incredibly important in terms of the brain functioning now you saw those hemispheres right there's a right and left hemisphere before right when we were looking down at the brain well those hemispheres are connected with all of these fibers these are called commissures and they, these connect the right and left hemisphere so they can work together. Because if these, if you cut a person's brain and they have a split brain, the right hemisphere doesn't know what the left hemisphere is doing, and the left hemisphere doesn't know what the right hemisphere is doing. And Susie goes, I relate to that. No, <laughs> me too. I mean, sometimes I didn't know what one side of me was doing and the other side of me was doing. So this is looking at the brain from the side now. And you see those, all those foldings are the cerebral cortex. The frontal lobes is where our high level of learning takes place. This is where we weigh, we rank and rewards as we regulate emotions and thoughts. This is where judgment takes place. Parietal lobes is where we communicate with other people. You know, the back of the brain, that's where we process information. You see, we don't see with our eyes. We see with our brain through our eyes. So all that information goes to the back of these occipital lobes. Temporal lobes is where we process, you know, auditory information. That's where our memory is at. As you go deeper into the brain, the brain stem is what regulates us. That's what regulates your heart rate, your, your sleeping, your eating. The cerebellum is what controls your coordination and balance. All of these things work in an amazing way. 
you know, it's we are an incredible species. I mean, I can't begin to tell you the awe I have for for who we are and how our brains operate. They're pretty incredible. Now, there's a lot of research that looked at what's called hemisphere specificity, that the left hemisphere, if you are right handed, then your left hemisphere is going to be very much analytical. It's going to be involved controlling. It's going to have, uh, it's going to want certainty. It's going to look at things sequentially. This is going to be your computing side of your brain. This is where language takes place. On the right side of your brain, in the right hemisphere, is where we have wonder in life. We're playful. We see things as in a whole. We don't break them down in little specifics. We, we experience the whole picture. That's the gestalt. Things occur simultaneously, not sequentially, in this part of the brain. Now we have this is where spatial ability is involved, right? In looking at situations and stuff like that. This is where our imagery takes place, our imagination and our intuition. Very, very different functions. If a person is just left hemisphere, they're gonna probably be an engineer. You guys met an engineer? They can't function on that right side of their brain at all. Everything's logical. Everything's on. If you meet an artist that's a complete artist, they're all right hemisphere dominant. They don't have a, an analytic thought in their brain. Everything is artistic and they look at the world in a different way. So we can see that certain people are stuck on one side versus the other. Well, being creative means integrating these two modes of consciousness that are right and left hemisphere. So grabbing a hold of is which part of the brain? Left hemisphere, right? Hanging loose, right hemisphere, right? Grabbing a hold of, hanging loose. So if you find yourself trying to grab a hold of a situation you can't get anywhere, hang loose, let go for a while. See what happens. Being active, I've got to do this, I've got to solve it, I've got to solve this problem. That's the left hemisphere, right? Got to have a solution. It's, it's that sequential part. There's got to be, if there's a problem, there's a solution to it. The right hemisphere is living in a passive, receptive wonderment with the problem. We just live with it. Now, if you're doing that, always movement. If you're on one side, you want to try to move a bit to the other side. Right. So either way, if you're hanging loose, you may need to get hold of it. Right. If you're just living passive with this wonderment, you might need to get active and get involved in taking care of it. One side is not right versus the other or better than the other. They're both valuable to us. Mental health is an appropriate balance and coordination of all of what we are. An appropriate balance and coordination. At times, it's good to grab a hold of things. Other times, it's important to hang loose. Sometimes, it's great to be active and solve a problem. Sometimes, just live in passive wonderment about it. Oh, my God, isn't this interesting? Let's see where this goes. Sometimes, you want to analyze the particulars. Sometimes, you need to step back and see the bigger picture. Being in control versus flowing with the process. This is where a lot of us have problems. We want to be in control all the time. Let go, flow, see what happens when you're not in control. Being certain, that's good at times, but allowing yourself to be confused. Hey, I'm not really sure what the hell to do with this one. Let me just sit with my confusion for a while. Being serious versus having a sense of humor. Being curious and allowing yourself to just float in dullness. Experience at once sequentially and seeing the whole simultaneously. Naming things and seeing the spatial imagery of things. Being intellectual and then attending to your intuition. So you see, all of these things are available to you. We just have to cut, you know, be able to tap into them. So we go back once again to this idea that about living in the space between, and this is Dr. Viktor Frankl, who's you know sharing the same idea that Dr. Rollo May shared. There's a space between the stimulus and our response, 
In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Try to live there. So what I'd like you to do today when we do open up the shares here in about five minutes is please share some examples of solving a problem um, that you had creatively, solving it in a very different way than you would have typically solved the problem. I think that would be good for us to share today. So just some little examples. Um, yesterday on Saturday, um, I was taking my daughter um, with my wife over to her tutoring. And we, we went straight from, um, the girls had tennis on Saturday morning and picked up my wife. She dropped her car off and she had a pretty hectic morning and she forgot to bring the work math sheet that Maddie needed to review for a test coming up this week. And she was all, oh my God, I forgot it. Oh, that's, you know, and she wanted to start beating herself up and stuff. And I said, hold on, wait a minute. Your mom's home, isn't she? She goes, yeah why don't you have your mom pull it out and take a picture of it with her phone and then send you the images? Problem solved. Now, had I turned her and say, oh my God, how could you do that? How could you leave? You knew we were doing the tutoring. If I started beating her up over not having that math thing, what would have happened? Well, you know, first of all, I would have, we would have had a horrible day. We would have had conflict the rest of the day. If she was taking care of herself, she says, well, you didn't bring it either. So we would have blamed, we would have said, who's, who's the fault? <laughs> you know, you're the idiot. No, you're the idiot. We would try to get who's the biggest idiot here in the relationship. Well, <laughs> hands down, I probably would win that one. But <laughs> that's another story for another day. But do you see what goes wrong? If you're not fixing on dealing with what is, and you get lost in blaming that whole little thing that was easily solved, even if we didn't, couldn't get, for mom wasn't, happened to be at the house. You know, we could have figured out some other possibility. But getting lost in blaming, and whose fault is it? People do not do better by telling them how wrong they are or how stupid they are, how dumb they are, that they should have done it differently. People don't grow that way. People don't learn that way. You do not get what you want by making somebody feel bad about who they are to get what you want. And if there's nothing else you hear from today, please hear that. That if you're struggling in a relationship, dump the blame. Stay focused on talking about what you want and seeing what you could do to get your needs met rather than making the other person responsible. If you do that, you will find some novel solutions to your problems.